Hey, everybody. Welcome to On the Road to DevHops. My name is Trace Bannon, and of course, I am here with my partner in crime, Brian Finster. You know, every time we get together, we virtually belly up to the bar and compare drinks, compare notes, and kind of kvetch about the day. But Brian, I, I've just got to know, what is the cool shirt you are wearing today? So I went on vacation recently, and I went to spend seven hours walking like like eight miles at the at the uh, Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. And this is one of my favorite X-Planes, the XB-70. Uh, so now you've got a better background than me. So we've talked about that. I always just show up in my office. You've got a yeah, cool background. A, I'm also a big fan of the Martian because we always yes. science the shit out of this. You got, got a better background, got a better t-shirt because I'm just plain, plain pink t-shirt, though I do have my... My old school, this is my Deloitte uh, certified architect from when I was with Deloitte and we set up a really cool program there, um, but that's a talk for another day. But we could compare ice. Can we compare ice? Do you have ice in your glass? I've got ice in my glass. Check out my cool ice. Look at this. Look how neat uh, this no, is. I, I, I took oh. my bourbon neat. So I'm, I'm oh. having a blue note bourbon from Tennessee today. And what, what, are, you, what are you having? Hmm. No. Well, I have a, a sparking, sparkling blackberry concoction today, so my drink just has the really cool cubes in it. Now, I will say this. I will admit this. Those cubes may or may not be ones that I have borrowed from my son. So i just just putting it out there. He may or may not be old enough to have those, but I borrowed them from my son because they were super duper cool. <laughs> so... Oh my goodness. So boy, it has been quite a few days since we talked and let me open up. We had, we are actually taking some notes back and forth um, because we've been frustrated with a topic lately. Um, yeah. That topic is, hey peeps, I know you want to code, but what about knowing the domain that you're in? What about actually diving into the problems in your problem space? Um, Brian, you and I, I think of both posted against this, uh, uh, the number of responses is off the chain. It's just, just yeah. crazy amount of people coming out of the woodworks to say, you gotta, you gotta know the domain. There's what also are... a crazy amount of people saying, oh, no, 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 that's not my job. <sighs> I've heard that. I've heard that. Let's be clear what we mean by knowing. Oh. By knowing the domain, you know, we're talking about the context of there are problems to solve. Mm -hmm. I am not a coder. I don't type code. I'm a business expert solving business problems with mm. code. Right? That's what a, that's a software engineer is solving real problems real people have and doing it the simplest way possible. And you have to know the problem space. You have to know the domain you're working in to make good micro decisions all the time. So that's what oh. I mean by knowing the domain. So I tend to agree with you that knowing the domain is just that. And in my role through the years, I've had the benefit of changing domains and sometimes changing domains rapidly. And when that happens, what I ultimately have to do is identify somebody who is already an expert in that domain so they can mentor me that I have somebody to turn to. But I will say the number of folks that I've encountered, especially recently, as I've been doing some different staffing efforts, who have said to me, no, I, that's not my domain and I'm not really interested. I, I, I want to, I want to write code. I want, or better yet, the one that I keep getting, I want to, I want to build things. I want to, want to build things. And I, I can appreciate that because I want to experiment, dude. I want to spend every day, all day in a room alone coding. It's fun. It's glorious. It's wonderful. And yet, if it's just writing code, if it's just tinkering with it, techno tinkering, right? If we're just techno tinkering, what 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 good is it? What what real good is that? Yeah, so, and, you know, and I've seen a couple of of really interesting patterns, right? Well, so number one, uh, and and you know this, and hopefully the you know the the viewers know this that I talk a lot about continuous delivery. Mm -hmm. You too. And continuous delivery isn't, we got Jenkins, we're doing continuous delivery. I mean, continuous delivery is a workflow where we can deliver very small changes to get feedback on what? To get feedback on what? On quality. And so what's, what is quality? It's, it's useful to the end user. 
But to do that, we have to be really good at understanding the problem we're, and decomposing that problem into small changes. We can get feedback on hypothesis-driven development. We're running business hypotheses or problem space hypotheses. Are we better solving this problem with this change? Which means you have to understand the domain to be doing CD. So it's astounding to me that people just want to code because how can you <laughs> test effectively if you don't understand? They, the because they don't want it. They don't want to test. They don't want to test. Remember what folks want to some. We've got to qualify this by saying it's some. We've yeah, got yeah. to quantify. Say, it's not everybody. Say, it's not everybody. I don't have a survey, but based off of anecdotal data from the number of responses that agree with us versus the number of responses of people that disagree, I will say it is a relatively small minority. It's too big to make me comfortable. Yes, that's the problem. It's too big a minority to ignore it and count it a, a blip, to count it as just an anomaly, because I'm seeing a trend. Now, some of the reasons that people have stated are, are pretty interesting well, no, no, and, no, no, and there's one other i wanted to give, there was two examples i wanted to give i want to give another okay. another okay. kind of problem resume driven development well and that's where we add complexity to something that's unneeded because we want to try out something so we can say we did i literally saw a team one time that had a product made up of four different languages they mm -hmm. used java uh, I hope it's, let me see, another double check. So they're using Java, they're using Scala, they're using C Sharp, they had an Angular front end, and they were going to spin up a brand new service using Python because they wanted to learn Python. <sighs> they didn't so, need Python. They wanted it. They well, wanted and to learn Python. I'm thinking that probably the majority of folks who are giving me this I want to build are actually falling into two camps. One of them is that it's, um, a nervousness, but it's a resume driven mentality. I need to stay current. I want to stay current, but what is current and how do I get current and how do I bring value? How do you know that I am a valuable resource? Well, I have all the latest whiz bangs and doodads. So, yeah. so I think that that's, that's one part of it. Um, I also think that there are people who are, who have been burned. Like that, that's been a common theme that prior projects, prior efforts that they've had they may have been in a rut. They may not have been given room to grow. And so their next opportunity, like, no, nah, I, I don't really want to deal with business problems. I, I just want, I just want to code. So, I mean, I think that I'm, I'm seeing it fall into those, generally into those two camps. Now I haven't done a formal survey. I've gone back to those individuals and we're talking, it's, a, it's more than five that have said this directly to me in the last two weeks who've said, no, I, 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 I build, I, I build, like, okay, but do, do you want a job? Do you want well, to keep I mean, working at the place that you're you working wanna, at? Do you just want to build or do you want to build the right thing? Well, I think there's a, a mix up on what it means to be innovative and experimental. Innovative and experimental doesn't mean that, hey, they want to learn Python. They want to check it out. They want to understand, is it more effective? Does it bring a different value? Is there some reason to augment our tool suite? That might be a good reason for, for your example, Python. I was recently talking to a software factory. This is in the software factory in the government space, right? There are, there are about 30 of these things on the defense side of the house. I was talking to them and they said, but we have... We have this new Angular front end. I'm like, really? That's that's interesting. Tell me a little bit. How did you how did you choose that? We said, well, while well, we decided to do React and Angular, I'm like, excuse Why? me. Well, because the well because they wanted to give autonomy to the teams to choose, and this gets to another conversation that we've had before. They want too much autonomy instead of there being somebody with enough cognition to say, we probably shouldn't introduce both of these. We probably should figure out what's going to be a better fit for us, whether it's based on what we already know, based on time to get to market, if we don't want to all learn new things, whatever those trades you know, are. But that's, you know, a, that's a reason that I, people I are speak, doing both. I want to speak to this for a second, because I've seen, uh, you know, this area will use these two, we'll use this, you know, Java for back and Angular for the front and that's it. And I used to be on the side of, no, 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 no. I should be able to choose whatever language I want to use to deliver, you know, as far as the team, the team should choose. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I moved from 
product teams that were doing, you know, like user facing stuff to product mm -hmm. teams that were building platforms for the development teams and started learning the cost of supporting all of these technologies. It's and, tremendous. And, and how we can't move fast on anything because we have too many, we, the, our, the breadth of technologies we have to uh, support. It's off the chain. It's off the chain. It's off the chain. So the more diversity, balance. Yeah. Well, and that gets back to the conversations we've had on autonomy and the scope of autonomy. But I believe that there is a, a growing trend that some, and, and I'm positive with at least two of the people thinking back to it, that the veiled conversation was, I want to make my own choices. I, I, I want to make my own choices and therefore it must be my team at the, you know, and therefore we need autonomy. And so that's, Maybe a causation, but let's so some, of, some of the responses that we had. And let's dissect this a little bit because I think it'll help us navigate with everybody this whole phenomenon that's happening. And and like you said, it's happening enough that we need to have the conversation about why it's happening. So let me let me grab one of these. I'm gonna I'm actually gonna read a direct quote. What we bring to the table is knowledge of data structures and algorithms product is responsible for the business problems. And if they fail, I, I can get a job somewhere else. If they fail, I am a highly qualified software engineer, which this person obviously is not. I can get a job somewhere else if the company fails because product screwed up and it's not my problem. But and, just and read the indignance in that. I can, I see that this, this is, this isn't even misunderstanding the role. This is ethics. I consider this an ethical problem right is i'm just a hired gun i'm just i'm here to push code i don't really care about the business problem i'm trying to solve i'm just going to be i'm going to create elegant code to solve whatever and if they you know i'm not going to give them i'm not engaged yeah. at all if they just pay me and i spit out code and that's all it is and i'm a senior software engineer and i was like no you're not hey i i have knowledge of data structures and algorithms and product is responsible for the business problems look if they fail because they can't figure out the business problems I'll, I'll go somewhere else yeah yep yep a, yep you know in a good economy or you can make that business incredibly successful and hopefully get a taste if you're working for a good company well and you know on a on a on a sidebar we're in this funky state when it comes to the economy right now, when it comes to what's happening in the tech industry, there's tremendous hiring, there's tremendous firing, there's, enough, there's tremendous enough, spin. Interesting, interesting pendulum hmm? swing where everybody was like, oh, it's, everything's remote and the software developers are, are massively in demand and I can demand anything I want and yada, 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 and then lay off, lay off, lay off, lay off, lay mm -hmm. off because mm -hmm. we're going through incredible peaks and valleys right now and it's... Mm -hmm. It's amazing people aren't really career planning. Exactly. So maybe right now is the time to say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to fix that other sentence. You know, what I bring to the table is knowledge of the data structures and the algorithm. I understand that I'm going to need to really get to know the product team and the business problems so that we don't fail implied that it was unfair that they had to learn the business problem and us not expect the business to learn about technology. I was like, well, number one, that this isn't about fair. This is about solving the problems most effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you want the business on your side, then speak to them in their language. Well, and the business, it has been my experience over a couple of decades that the business become, they're, they're tech adjacent. They become tech savvy. They, they actually really get to understand, right? They're not going to code demand. beside you, but they get to know what's going on. And they exactly actually, so. you solve the problems more quickly in the future together. Hey, do you remember what we did over here? I have a flavor of that. Is that the right approach for this? How could we do that? Yes, that you is Yeah, you don't beautiful. demand for fair. You don't demand that they meet you in the middle. You go to them and bring them to you. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. how relationship building is works. So... Let me, let me, let me read you another one. And this one, I have a little bit of, I have a little bit of empathy for this when I first read it. And then I had to contemplate what's the real impact. And that is, mm. uh, Hey, um, I've been using the same tech stack for five years in a row and it can become incredibly boring. You know, I talked to my wife about this one and she got lit up. Really? Oh yeah. Because she used, she's been using the same tech stack for a while. Mm -hmm. She's currently solving really interesting problems with tools for, for 
for case management, for forensics, that mm -hmm. developing capabilities even the FBI doesn't have, right? Working, at, uh, but but it's boring tech stack. So you know she probably change jobs so she can get some more, uh, you know, get a notch in her belt for another language or something. This this takes me to two different thoughts. One about the being in that same place for a long time, being having the opportunity to grow within that domain space is something that your wife had. So she's she's using that same technologies, but creatively applying it, solving newer and bigger and different challenges. We have to curate that lust towards solving the problems in the next generation. I, there's an entire group that I'm seeing that, you know, back to, I just want to code. They want to learn a new language. They want to learn the new technology. I think some of it's, as you said before, fear-driven with the, the resume-driven development. I think some of it is fear of not keeping up with the new things that are happening. But heck, if you're solving a problem, I mean, we're not asking people to go back and, and write assembler. There, there are people is, still out there writing assembler. Always, this is always supposed to have been a problem solving career, right? Well, but we don't verbalize it that way. I want go I and take a look. No. So I was cleaning out a box this weekend and I will have to I will have to go and get this for our next conversation. And I found a couple of my college comp sci notebooks. And I gotta tell you, mm, there was all kinds of stuff about data structures. There was all kinds of things about um, the the uh, how I could make my searches efficient and my algorithms effective. There wasn't a lot of conversation about the business domain. There wasn't a lot of conversation about getting in there and solving the problem. So I'm telling you that in the colleges, at least in the four-year schools, they're not focusing on the problem solving the way that we need to help to train them up and have a passion for problem solving. Their passion is around learning a new tool, applying a new technology, and they're considering that problem solving, the, the mastery as a problem solving, as opposed to the, you know, really artistic application of that technology. So. Yeah. Um, you can hide for that way for a while, but you'll never be a senior engineer at a company that's really looking for something uh, amazing to happen. That's not actually innovation. Now, and, and that, so this brings us to something else that someone brought up, right? Is that, well, I mean, that's if you're only focused on business, then that could be true. But what about all the frameworks and languages and tools? I'm like, uh, excuse me, nobody as a hobby developed Java. Nobody as a hobby developed uh, React or Angular. Those, these are all tools to solve business problems. Oh, no. Nobody as a hobby developed Jenkins. It's a tool to solve a problem. All of these no, are I'm, tools to make us more uh, productive or to so solve. So let me, let me get in the middle of that though, because I have people that I love and adore who contribute in, in open source, they play with things on the weekend. They look for new opportunities. So I, I don't want to discount that there are folks who are playing in a hobby space because they have an interesting idea. Usually it's based on some kind of business problem, but the, you know the, they, they are kind of focused on well, figuring but, out new ways of doing things. But hang on, hang on. They're not getting paid for that, right? So true, sometimes true. they're doing open source to solve real problems that they have, mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. they're just, it's a hobby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and if you're if you if you're doing it for hobby, that's completely different. You're 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 either solving an interesting problem that's outside the scope of your daily work, or you're not solving a problem at all. You're just playing, right? And you can play. That's fine. You know, one of the examples I gave somebody is because uh, somebody said that I obviously was a subpar engineer because I was focused on a problem I'm trying to solve, instead of uh, you know like doing real work, you know. And, and staying current on stuff. Mm. I stay on mm. the things I need to stay current on. And I said, you know what? My, my father owned a construction company. He was a, car a trained carpenter. Uh, he spent his entire life uh, in the building industry. Mm -hmm. You know what he didn't do at home for fun? Building. It wasn't his hobby. Okay? I've spent nearly 30 years in the software industry as an engineer. I've built st uh, stuff that I'm incredibly proud of that have mm -hmm. impacted people's lives. It's not my hobby. I will mm. sometimes come home and code something to try out something or, or uh, you know, I'm trying to learn something new for work, you know, 
but I'm often on my motorcycle or in doing photography. Well, I have other lives. You don't have to be a software monk. Well, you don't have to be a software monk, but I would not discount. I know, I know some folks and they, that it's their hobby. It's their day job. It's their sure. evening. And that's, that's, and, that, cool. that's, and cool. that's, and it's great. But, but I think your point is don't expect it. Don't expect the, you know, hobbyist type app, that genre, the way that we go at it, the way that we're truly playing with reckless abandon, bringing down whatever we want. Yeah. That's, that's, that is having fun and you do it in a hobby state. Sometimes you'll do it in an innovation phase where you need to just get out there and learn something new. But to your, to your point, you know, it, it is about solving the business problems. Let me read another one to you. It's not the software engineer's obligation to figure out business problems and the resources need to, needed to solve them. That task belongs squarely with project management. Well, number one, if you're running projects, you've already failed because you don't do software. Software development is all about developing new and innovative things. And project <laughs> management is for delivering the same thing we know how to do again and again and again. Uh, and so. You shouldn't have a project manager for doing software development unless you're solving a problem that's already solved, in which case buy the competitor's product. Now somebody will we'll have to have another conversation about that because there's a there's a whole world of project management folks. Don't discount all project management. Not all project management is bad or old school or waterfall. But the you know, the product expert won't be sitting next to every single person on the team so that they can mm -hmm. make good decisions all the time. And if you're, de if you're depending on the product expert to provide all the tiny details all the time so that you can make good decisions to implement them, mm -hmm. then what you're implementing is defects. It's our job to make good decisions about architecture, about the resources required, what should be implemented. It's our job to say, hey, this might be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things I point out to is right after the 737 MAX stuff happened, articles started coming out about some of the decisions that Boeing mm -hmm. made. I remember mm -hmm. an article, they were talking about how they'd, they to save money on software development, they'd offshore the software development to a third party. Instead of using internal development teams who had long experience in the domain mm -hmm. of flight control. Yep. Right. Um, and so, it, uh, you know, how many of those developers understood enough to ask questions about some of the requirements that were given? Another example, not quite as disastrous as several airplanes becoming lawn darts and killing a bunch of people. Uh, another airplane had an incident. It was a major incident. And the major incident was that they took way too much runway to take off. Uh, it turns out that they were overloaded by 1500 pounds versus what they thought they had. And the reason was that the software developers, uh, there was an update release where the software developers believed that anyone named with a miss MS, mm -hmm. a part of their name was a child female and not just an unmarried person. And so they made weight allocations like, oh, it's Miss Jones, obviously a child, right? And so they overloaded the airplane because they didn't fully understand what they were doing. This gets to, you know, something we, we started out with saying, you got to know the domain. I often no, you say don't. you have to know the context. It's your responsibility to not be blindly working inside now, you know, I, you know, I think I've told you before, my brother's a building architect and he, he has learned, he, he has set bricks, he knows how to hammer, he knows how to do these things, but that's not, that's not what he focuses on. But when he brings people in, when he's managing a construction site or when he's part of that, people know what the big vision is. They know where they fit in and they have to learn about it. They learn when they're building schools about the curricula and how the children are going to be flowing through it. So they get a better visualization for what it is that they're trying to accomplish. Even if he's guiding the vision, they are implementing on that vision. That's, that's very similar here, understanding the context. And there's, there's more to knowing it than when we think about old school functional, we say well, you've got to have a functional expert. Oh, so your dog, my dog, all the dogs are all barking. My um, dogs are barking at your dogs. Okay. Well, and, and my dogs, <laughs> my dogs are barking at the dogs outside. Um, so, you know, it, there's, 
biz, people get kind of turn their nose up that I, I don't want to know the business, but if you're codifying the rules of the business, if you're codifying the policies around what happens, if you're thinking about um, applying CI, CD, it, I don't care if you think it's sexy, cool, or if you just, you know, it's, if it's a mandate, all of those things require that you, they require, they require that you understand and know your domain. When I, to figure out what kind of secure coding approach that I'm going to take, it depends on what domain I'm living in. It depends on the context. It depends on the business. So this is, this is, uh, this is actually really timely. A friend of mine just interviewed for a position as a uh, chief information security officer for a mm -hmm. kind of a smallish, medium sized company. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as, as hopefully people know, CISO is a C-suite role. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, she's currently like a team lead on the development team in security. You want to know why they're looking at her very strongly? Okay. Because they're technical and, te and, and the bias of the hiring person is that technical people are problem solvers who are always looking for problems to solve and don't just sit around idle. Hmm. That's his understanding of what a technical person should be doing. And the problem we should not be solving is how do I add something else to the stack so that I can pad my resume? Exactly, exactly. But you know, to go back to yet another quote, if that's true, the techies are going to be unhappy, they're going to leave your company if you make them, you know, stay with the same technology so, or make them know the domain. You know, uh, I would encourage anybody who says, I'm not learning enough different things here to leave, right? Because number one, if you're not getting interesting problems, mm -hmm. you should go find more interesting problems. If your yep. goal is to collect, is to cargo cult technologies, and you know what? I don't want you on my team because I'm solving interesting problems. And we're right. really focusing on interesting problems, not on adding more complexity, which in complicates operational support and destabilizes the application, right? We care about operations. That's what we care about. We want to solve interesting problems with stable solutions. <laughs> Let's pick another one of these um, sentences and see if it, it, if it gets your ire. Um, let me see. Oh. I think other engineering domains generally have this mindset more to the forefront. That said, I personally would dial it back 20 to 10 to 20% for developers. Intellectual stimulation is a key part of why we've chosen a tough career path and continuing education ensures that we can continue to act as trusted advisor to the end users. You know what? Tell that that sound like a whole bunch of hoo-hoo. Yeah, tell that to an electrical engineer that his job's not intellectually stimulating. Tell that to mm -hmm. a civil engineer that his job's not intellectually stimulating. I mean, because all we do is live in mud houses. There's no such thing as, as you know, like um, the, you know, the Empire State Building or mm -hmm. the Brooklyn Bridge, which had never been done before. Or I went to Falling Water in Pennsylvania on vacation. Uh, so, but fun fact about Falling Water. There was a crap ton of brand new things that had never been done mm -hmm. in the 30s in falling water. And they're, oh, I know. Still, they're still patching it because it keeps breaking because it's not a very stable structure. Correct. The, the cantilevers cool. are amazing. Well, you know that yeah. my favorite architect ever Right? Is, right, is yeah. is Frank Lloyd. And for an anniversary a couple of years ago, my husband took me to Falling Water. For the, and I've, I've studied that building for years, but had never gone there. And he managed to arrange for us to have a private tour in the fall with the foliage. Oh, oh man, you talk, but it was incredible because they were, they were doing more renovations on one area where some of the, that cantilevered concrete, he was tremendous with trying things with that cantilevered concrete. And we've learned a lot about it, but it doesn't mean that the original doesn't need to be patched, but. It was you know. the very first time it ever been done. And mm -hmm. there was more than that, that was the very first time that ever been done. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's from an operational stability point of view, not very operationally stable. Well, there are a couple of things that Frank did that were more, um, aesthetic at times he was but he was also stretching he was also he would also engage he with was, his was, people and would say i'm going to be out there on the experimental edge no, are you okay with that 
No, no, I, I agree. And and the budget was thirty uh, thirty thousand dollars, and it cost one hundred fifty thousand dollars to mm -hmm. deliver it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's nineteen thirties dollars. I know. Uh, now imagine if that was your primary mode of operation at all times, instead of a one off experiment to show what's possible. Then we're going to be a bankrupt business. But let's the thing that really pissed me off about this quote is we should dial it back ten to twenty percent for developers. No, no. We're not special snowflakes. <laughs> we have responsibilities to the people we're trying to help. Well, no, we need to dial it back so people have the opportunity to express themselves, to try out these new things, to experiment yeah, like during the day. Civil engineers, electrical engineers, mm -hmm. real engineers. You know, the, the reason software engineers, you know, the title software engineer gets laughed at by real engineers is because we're irresponsible as a community. Mm -hmm. And I believe that as a community, we should hold each other accountable well, to there is, actual ethics. There's more than that. An electrical engineer has a degree and a certification as an electrical engineer. A mechanical yeah. engineer has a degree and a certification for it. Yeah. Yeah. So many, 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 many of our software engineers are, are self-taught and not certified. So there's like, and there's no certifying body for this. So don't get me wrong. So I, I get where they're coming from. And I have this argument with my brother, the building architect all the time. So let's, I want to center back up though. One of these, there was one sentence that was really popular, that, that was a real positive. And then I want to go back to a little bit more of the red. And it was, and, and I heard this from, I've got like, 15,000 reactions, positive reactions saying, yes, you need the domain space. That's where it is tracking right now. I wish this were a more popular view. There's an outrageously strong bias towards overcomplicating simple things with novel technologies. Yeah. And that's, that's related to resume driven development, right? It is. It it's is. Like, and also conference driven development. So there was uh, another team that, uh, I, I had talked to you one time and they were in the process of the, there's so much fail here. It's really hard to parse, but they were running for months going and, uh, uh, decomp and, and laying out the new services that they were mm -hmm. gonna, microservices they were okay. going to put together to decompose their monolith into. Um, now number one, they were struggling to operate their monolith. It was very unstable. Okay. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have a stable monolith, don't touch microservices. Okay. So that's number one, because if you can't operate, you don't want to multiply the problem. Number two, I asked them, can I see your domain diagram? They didn't know my, what it was. My what? They my huh? What a, they didn't know what a domain diagram was. They never heard of domain driven development. And, and yet they had a plethora of microservices. I talked to a friend of mine at another large enterprise who came in uh, and, and that enterprise had done something similar before he got there. And he had, they had one microservice that had 50 dependencies. They had 50 other microservices that it was consuming from. Uh, a little bit of SOA. <laughs> it was a distributed monolith, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and, and there, but, but the reason why is because they went to a conference and heard how great microservices were. Well, that's, it's, we, we hear this all the time. I've started to say context rules. I was going to say context is king, but then that gets in the whole gender bias thing. I was going to say context is queen and then no one would listen. So context rules. So context rules without context applying any technical solution, applying any pattern, any practice without the context, AKA understanding the domain, context and domain are not in entirely interchangeable, but damn, they are linked up together. Yeah. If you don't understand your unique context, you can look at anybody else's um, implementation, anybody else's pattern, anybody else's success or their failure, rote copying will result nine times out of 10, 99 times out of a hundred will result in a failure because you're not exactly the same. There needs to be some cognition, right? Of, of what you're doing. If they were trying to look at, um, a microservices, why, if it was it because they could, didn't have a strong quality signal for their monolith. Okay. Let's worry about that first before we start decomposing everything 
Then we have to look at where, where are there um, fracture, possible fracture lines that we could look at where we might be able to parse out where it would be appropriate to do that. But that's not, we're just gonna, we're just gonna <laughs> go ahead and create a massive, you know, but uh, without a domain model, with, with no domain diagram, with no pictures, well, with no one of the thought. problems we have in the industry is that there's so much good information out there and there's so much bad information out there. And generally what happens is people find information that agrees with them Mm -hmm. with their, inter in their internal dialogue. And then everybody has to learn all of the mistakes individually. Mm -hmm. Isn't know? that funny how that, not to get too um, poetic, but isn't it interesting how that's kind of how we view all information that's coming into us right now, all information, media, um, oh, yeah. news, we look at it and for whatever reason, we are, as a, as a culture group, technology or not, We've got some kind of a filter on where we're looking, maybe it's because of the amount of it that's coming at us. We're looking at the things that agree with some part of our brain. So this, this agrees with my brain. Yep. I'm having a hard time with my monolith. Um, you know what? That person said microservices. Okay. We're going to go do microservices. That's the only thing that we can go and do. And they squirrel away and they go and do that. It's interesting. You know, just the, that that has well, become or, a part of the know. philosophy. I want to say that I, I, I decompose them on within the microservices. If they are resume driven, they might, or they might be trying to solve a problem, but they're trying to run too fast. The amount of people I run into who have honest problems, but that are not patient enough to get to a, a real answer. They, they yeah. mandate something or somebody comes up with a whack-a-mole idea and they glom onto that. And I think it's systemic of being overwhelmed so you know when accelerate came out i read accelerate and mm -hmm. then i went back and i got an electronic version of accelerate mm -hmm. uh so that i could have so i could highlight the electronic version and have references mm -hmm. um and uh, recently dave farley released modern software engineering and i'm yep. I, i'm going through and rereading mm -hmm. that with electronic version to start highlighting it and oh by the way i have a i, I have a, a, a hard copy here of it as well and i've ordered highlight you know like bookmark tabs so i can go through and highlight and bookmark this the like the, the physical the physical copy you're not but using with, these old school things yeah, yeah i'm using one of those but with okay. tabs tabs so i can find out where the highlights are right so um but i was just reading the part to yes those exact things and i'm reading the part today where they were talking about where he's talking about going through and methodically diagnosing an issue and they're mm -hmm. they're you know obvious oh it's got to be this thing of course it wasn't that you know it was the last change they made and the thing that they were looking at is the obvious issue was just a symptom of the issue and the, the point being that you need to understand how to step back and diagnose problems it's not two jobs to know the domain and know the engineering Mm -hmm. You have your engineering for the domain, mm -hmm. okay? And you have to take the same approach to both. You're not a feature factory. You're not just implementing some feature someone's giving you. You're stepping back and looking at the problem we're trying to solve. Instead of saying, do this, I'm like, okay, well, what problem are we trying to solve? I need to understand the problem because your solution might be awesome, but it's possible, possible that I've got another point of view related to the domain to make it a better solution or to exactly. say, have you thought about this from this, have you thought about this, what you're doing with the solution, the other things will impact with the rest of the domain. Well, and there's, so I'm going to add on to this, add to it. The understanding the domain also means that you communicate and collaborate with other people inside that domain, not just inside your company necessarily. Yeah. By, by talking to other people in a similar domain space, there are actually patterns, practices, experiences that they can share. So FinTech should be talking to FinTech in the same type. Biomed should be talking to Biomed that are solving similar challenges. You do want to have that cross-pollination, but all of that tracks back to 
domain. I shouldn't just pick up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go over here and talk to SpaceX because obviously what I'm building over here is just like SpaceX. We hear this all the time in our, in our daily work. Um, <laughs> or I'm going to, the, the one that drives me crazy is we're going to adopt the Spotify model. I hear that at least once a week, I hear that. And then I'm, I, I send them over to the sad MF site and say, study this and I'll get your certifications and all will be good. Um, you, the, at the end of the day, you know, it feels like we've pounded on this quite a bit and, and maybe we'll kind of start to, to close out. Being a software architect, being a software engineer, being a developer, being a technologist, all of those things, unless you are truly in a research only role yeah. that you're not problem solving, anybody other than those few. If you're not doing pure research or playing. Correct. Then you need a domain, what a, your work domain, understand your domain, understand the content, embrace it. And if you don't like it, if it bores you, don't stay in that context, yeah, change it. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. something else that people are afraid of is, you know, I've, I've been doing, I've been working in this, you know, the, the government space I've been doing um, child welfare systems for 15 years now, and we've do, done new technologies, but I'm not really interested in the business. Okay. You've got transferable skills. Take all of that goodness and learn a new domain that excites you. Just find a domain that does excite you. I'm wondering if that's part of the problem. Now, as a leader, Brian, you and I both have imperatives that we're looking for those folks who are saying, hey, uh, I just want to build and helping them to grow a mental model, helping them to change so that they want to learn the domain. I mean, We've, we've got to help build that culture of, of wanting to learn and wanting to problem solve. And, and yeah, we can have some sexy, fun techno tinkering on the side, but maybe we have to do that in, in different ways. Maybe we can help, you know, maybe scratch that itch without, uh, without them um, doing that all as their day job. Maybe that's the, the fun Friday. Maybe that's the, uh, the hackathon that you have as a, 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 you know, the at work hackathon. There are ways that we can help our people to scratch that itch to get those new things without them feeling that that has to be day in and day out. So Brian, I want to, I want to close by having you close. What do you, what do you want to leave people to think about with this topic? Well, you know, I, I have a feeling that, uh, the, uh, the smarter Fenster would like to add something. <gasps> wait, is the smarter Fenster there? Where's the dog? Oh wait, no. Yeah, the, or Dana. The the smarter fenster is here, but what I need to do is I need to change my virtual background. Okay. There we go. Oh, there the same. oh she's oh, drinking I too. Yay, Dana. My am, I, am I allowed? <laughs> oh, no, lean in a little bit more and you look like a floating head. There you go. That's perfect. Wonderful. Floating head. <laughs> what do you want to add, sweetie? I want to add that skill up doesn't mean scratch the surface of the next big technology and keep scratching the surface and scratching the surface but that you can use the abilities that you've gained by working in technologies you've used for a while to solve those better problems in a more interesting area. Dana, thank you for, for popping in. I'd have, I'd have my husband pop in, but he's, but he's not here or the dogs. Yeah, that, they're that's locked absolutely out, but true. It you're is not going to be able to get in depth. If you're just cargo culling, culting technologies and say, yeah. look, I played with the thing. Yeah. You're not going to be good at it, you know, but if yeah. you solve interesting problems, that's what, that's what, hiring people want to see is like, look, I solved this problem and it caused this kind of impact and I'm going to solve mm -hmm. your problem. I care about your problem. Now, I do like thinking that I'm a builder, but I feel like I'm building solutions. I'm building answers to problems. I'm not building to build. I'm not spending my days techno tinkering. So I mean, personally, it bores me to tears to just have people say, go build this thing. I'm like, but why? I want to, I want to know, I want to, I want to know your problem. What did they used to say? Inquiring minds want to know. So. Yeah. Well, All right. and, uh, there's one, one last thing I want to leave you with. Uh, okay. A friend of mine reminded me of this recently. The, the first CIO of Walmart, where I spent a, several years, um, laid out some three core principles for the, uh, for Walmart technology. Mm -hmm. The third one was merchants first, technologists second. That what we, that we, we are, I, again, it was that, and, and it's something that you really didn't even hear talked about when I was there. I was there for 19 years. You didn't really hear people talk about it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I visited SpaceX one time and SpaceX was very similar. It was the atmosphere you breathe. You just understood that this is, this is just our way of working is that we're deep in the business problem and trying to solve it with technology. If you exactly. go to SpaceX, um, everybody understands the broader mission of SpaceX and they live and breathe uh, things like continuous, they don't, you don't talk about continuous delivery at SpaceX because why would you talk about water if you're a fish? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Right? And it's just the environment you live in. Uh, and people that, businesses that have that environment of mission and you're on the mission and not just I'm a coder, right? Right. They're far more successful than companies that are just like, oh, well, we want to make sure our talent's happy by making sure they can, they can learn all the cool stuff, even if we don't need it or not. We, this message needs to go to all levels. It needs to go to techies. It needs to go to tech adjacent. It needs to go to business, the mission, the leaders, the, the new out of school. Everybody needs to know that we together need to be problem solving as organizations, as teams. And, and kind of dial in on it. So I'm hopeful for everybody who has watched this and listened today, please put comments, please reach out to us directly. Love to know what everybody thinks. Um, keep adding to what you've already been expressing out there in the LinkedIn world and in the social media world about this topic. It's important. If there are other topics as well, Please let us know, shoot us a note, connect with us on LinkedIn. You can also hit us up at the email address that's in the subscription line for this. Love to know what other topics are important in your world. Brian, it looks like you're chomping at the bit. One final parting well, blow. I was just, just to add to that, I mean, you and I have a broad network and we've had mm -hmm. several guests come on and we know a lot more that if people are really interested or have questions about anything around mm -hmm. the world, we've been doing this for a long time. And if we don't know, we know somebody who does. That's important. And, if we don't and, know, we do and know. And we want to learn. I mean, I want to learn. And I, mm -hmm. I always learn whenever we have somebody come come talk with us, right? Well, heck, and even I, when you and I rehash the same topic four times, I learn something when I walk away from it. So iron sharpens iron, my friend. It's good stuff. Absolutely. So I would I'd love to know what other people are interested in hearing about because I want to talk about it. Because I, this domain, you know, developing solutions for people to change lives. I love this domain. Yeah. 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 So do I. So do I. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. We'll, yep. we'll see you online. Yep. See you later, Tracy. Bye. Bye.